In this WrestleTalk news, Jeff Hardy shoots on his WWE release. WWE writers claim the job beats the creativity out of you. WWE bringing a pay-per-view to the UK this year, and so much more. Subscribe and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news videos. Support WrestleTalk! One of the more shocking releases from WWE in 2021, and there was a few, was Jeff Hardy, who left through the crowd during his match at a live event, behavior that was described as erratic, which led to Jeff Hardy denying the rehab WWE had offered, causing his release from the company. However, Jeff and his brother Matt had insisted that Jeff's drug results come back as they knew he would be clean, which they reportedly were. Now, with Jeff recently debuting in AEW, he and Matt have spoken on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy podcast about this turbulent time. Speaking on his departure from the live event match, Jeff said, Certain things happen for a reason. Subconsciously, that was maybe the smartest thing I've ever done. Guided by something higher than me, I'll say, That night in Edinburgh, Texas, I finished my heat, I took the heat, and I said, I'm ready to go. Went over the rail, disappeared into the crowd. Naturally, they think I took something like drugs or whatever, but I didn't. If I was that bad, I should have never went out there. That's the way I see it. My first day in AEW, I felt valuable for the first time. The care and love I was shown, I got chills thinking about it. In WWE, it felt like they just wanted to keep me there to sell action figures. On why he wanted to leave WWE, Jeff said, I felt like one of the most popular baby faces in WWE because the crowd was so with me at Survivor Series. Then there were other times when I felt like a ghost, roaming the halls like, why am I even here? I don't feel important. I've never been a politicker, so I don't go out of my way to try and get a certain spot or achieve a certain status. It made me think back to SummerSlam. It was a big crowd, and I was just there all day for nothing. Like, why am I even here? I was so excited to be a part of it, some little spot or something, but I wasn't even involved. Why am I even here? Not just SummerSlam, but why am I still here in WWE? What's my purpose? Because it didn't feel like I had much of one. Jeff also revealed his plan was always to join AEW once his contract expired. Anybody from AEW was like, how much longer you got? A little under two years now? That was ultimately ultimately the plan, depending on how things went throughout those two years. I'm in good shape, but I'm still pretty beat up. I don't know how much longer I've got, and I want to make the most of the time I do have. I'm sure Matt feels the same way. Let's get this in while we can. I felt like I was wasting away in WWE for my good moments that haven't happened yet while I'm healthy and feel good in the ring. I feel valued now, and that's very important as a performer. It had also been previously mentioned by Matt that Jeff had been offered a place in the WWE Hall of Fame, which he told them was a hard no if he couldn't be inducted alongside Matt. Speaking on their offer, Jeff mentioned, it felt completely wrong. It didn't feel like the time at all. I almost felt offended. My mind and emotion went crazy and I was in tears. This is my career. I know I've been a very influential person to a lot of young and misunderstood individuals, but it felt so wrong. It almost felt like, how dare you, in a sense. That's why I was like, it's a hard no, especially because it feels like something Matt and I should go in together as the Hardy Boys when the time is right. There is a ton more from this interview, so make sure to check out WrestleTalk.com for the rest. Now hot tag to Laurie for the rest of the news. Now, the job of a WWE writer entails coming up with complex, interweaving stories that build over the course of months to pay off on a grand scale at pay-per-view and then just ripping those plans up and just making something up on the day. It sounds like hell, actually. Writers famously love rewrites and WWE is all rewrites all of the time. And if that is the way it seems from the outside, then what must it be like? on the inside. Well, over the years, we've heard our share of horror stories from inside WWE, and Matt Men's Andrew Zarian has added to the pile. Because he said on his podcast recently that he was told by WWE writers that the job beats the creativity out of you. Oh, that is, that is damning. Because when you're technically writing for an audience of one before you can get any segments greenlit to go on TV, you likely end up pitching the same old safe stuff, I guess, that you know Vince is going to like, because otherwise you're not really doing your job if you're not getting anything on TV, are you? Because you just want to sit in catering as a writer, that's even worse than sitting in catering as a wrestler. I mean, that's likely why a lot of the best bits of WWE in terms of promo, storytelling and in-ring work in the past few years have occurred with stars who have a little more creative control. Your Roman Reigns's, your Daniel Bryan's, whoever that guy is now. He also said that some of the writers had lost total confidence in themselves as a writer, and that is despite having experience working on top-tier television shows before joining WWE. Proper TV shows 
with proper stories. Now, WWE does actually have quite high standards for hires and often goes for people with great credits to their name. Vince even said on the Pat McAfee show that his plan is always to surround himself with talented people. The and then ignore them was implied rather than explicit. Because really the job of being a WWE writer is to be the internet's punching bag. And it must be incredibly frustrating to pitch ideas, have them knocked back so write up something that you think will at least get onto TV because that's your job, get stuff on TV, and then be told, which you know, that it was not your best work. That would drive me insane. In other news, the rumours of a WWE pay-per-view happening in the UK have been swirling for a while, though many thought it was just wishful thinking. Perhaps not so much anymore though, as WrestleVotes on Twitter has said that one of their sources states that the long-awaited WWE United Kingdom pay-per-view return will take place Saturday, September 3rd at Principality Stadium in Cardiff, Wales. That is the same weekend as AEW's All Out pay-per-view, which would not be the first time that WWE has used a UK show to go up against AEW. NXT UK TakeOver Cardiff went head-to-head -head with All Out back in 2019. It was also the same day as NJPW's Royal Quest. I was very drunk. But the difference maker here is that this is a main roster show. So whether this is one of WWE's more famous named pay-per-views or something more bespoke like Crown Jewel or Super Showdown remains to be seen. What are some, what are some British things they could call it? Ah, oh, bangers and smash. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you think it should be called. Before we get on with the rest of the episode, we just need to thank the cleaner Kenny Shah, and he can last Sean for longer than you in the ring. Sean Furlong, he can last for their support on Patreon. Now, Bad Bunny has been putting in a shift with WWE, building to a program at last year's WrestleMania where he teamed with Damian Priest and making a surprise appearance in the Royal Rumble this year. We said backstage that Bunny's work ethic and respect for the business won him a lot of fans in the WWE locker room, including the Viper himself. This was revealed by Damian Priest on Shaq Wrestling when he said, I remember we walking backstage and at the time it was the Thunderdome and Randy Orton stopped because he was just crossing us and said, hey, I just want to say thank you for showing us the respect like no other. People don't usually do it this way. And he goes, I just want to say thank you and you've earned our respect. And then he pulled his hand out and he shook Bunny's hand. I've added that. I've added that bit. Randy Orton used to touch his dick and then shake hands with people. Respect. But Bunny is not getting all of the respect that he deserves in WWE. Just look at that headline down there. Who thought they'd see that in a wrestling news video? Not me. Not when I woke up this morning. It's the apocalypse. Logan Paul, what are we going to do with you, you? Uh, the YouTube star turned boxer turned wrestler is gearing up for a match against Rey Mysterio and Dominic at this year's Mania under the tutelage of The Miz. Paul has been talking up his mentor to TMZ saying, Having him on my side to handhold me through the basics has been fantastic. I'm learning quickly and the more I learn, the quicker I'm learning. It takes me one attempt at something before I've got it. And talking down his predecessor, he said, everyone is comparing me to Bad Bunny like. He was training for this long or whatever. All due respect to Bad Bunny, I don't think I need to be in there as long to pick it up. It just comes very naturally to me and I want to raise the bar. He set the bar very high and so it's a good little push for me. I mean, reading the quotes, you can see that Paul is obviously a very humble man, so... Randy Orton's gonna, he's gonna love him. Another group of humble fellas have started a little promotion called Control Your Narrative. Now, CYN has a very specific set of rules. You're in control. You're in control. Fights is fights. Matches be matches. No super kicks, no destroyers, no suiciders, no fun, no drama, no rules, except these ones. Muscles be muscles, muscles be tough. Honestly, it's just, it's a bit ridiculous. And everyone has had a jolly good time taking the piss out of it on Twitter yesterday, especially the purveyors of super kicks, the Young Bucks, who as expected updated their Twitter bio to take a pop at CYN, saying super kicks, Canadians, tope suiciders, and even that thing where you run away from the opponent in the corner and do the dumb slide thing, all welcome. It's nice of them to let that corner thingy slide. Some people think it might be a bit, bit indie and not very tough. Rawr. So another major thing that happened this year was WWE pretty much changed their hiring policy when it comes to new recruits. The mission was to focus on athletes from outside of wrestling who have the look that Vince is after and then just plug them full of wrestling knowledge later. It makes sense because the best of all time in WWE had no wrestling knowledge, like Kurt, who knew nothing. Anywho, they announced their latest class of recruits yesterday and there are some interesting names among them. Front and center is former Ring of Honor Women's Champion Roxy, real name Carla Gonzalez, who was long rumored to be signed 
signing up with WWE. The 20-year-old joins 13 other newbies to WWE, including Bianca Corelli, the daughter of Santino Morella, who was dead chuffed, saying, proud daddy moment, making it is one thing, but watching her work for and earn it was the best part. Corelli has trained in MMA with a focus on judo, jiu-jitsu, and boxing. Also among the class, the former independent talents, Jake Tucker, Cole Carter, and the notorious Mimi, but the other nine athletes are generally from outside of wrestling. Hop in the fence now to talk AEW, and this week's Dynamite saw the coronation of a new AEW Women's Champion as Thunder Rosa toppled Britt Baker. Now, the show netted 993,000 viewers, according to Showbuzz Daily, and got a 0.38 rating in the 18-49 to 49 demo. The views were up, the demo was down. Figure 4 Wrestling Online attributed it to a drop in female viewers. They said the key to the 18-49 to 49 drop was actually with women, which had been way up last week. This week, women 18-49 dropped by 17.9% to a 0.23 rating. Females 12-34 to 34 were the only other category that dropped. So could the extreme nature of the Rosa and Baker match have been a turn-off for women watching, or is it just sort of a a regular fluctuation in viewership. It'd be interesting to see if the viewers return now that Rosa is the champion and moving on to a program with somebody else. Now, if this was WWE, they would obviously parachute in a celebrity to boost their viewing figures, like, um... Johnny Knoxville was for the Rumble. Johnny is actually now sticking around in WWE until Mania as his feud with Sami Zayn continues, but that wasn't always the original plan. Because Zayn told the Dallas Morning News that I don't think this was ever the plan for WrestleMania. I think he was here doing some stuff for Jackass Forever, doing the Royal Rumble and promoting his movie, and that's all well and good. Every single time I was in the ring with him, every time he snuck in the ring or he did what he did or wherever his music hit, it was by far the biggest reaction on the show that night. And I know because I was in the ring for all of them. So the fans love him. And I think what happens there is that such a gravitation towards him and the response was so good that I think it ended up pushing this story further. So what you're saying is, is the WWE do listen to the fans. Now that feels wrong to say, edit that out. Don't Definitely don't play that back in black and white slow motion. WWE do listen to the fans. And they announced this week that uh, it's been in development since 2019, but they're now doing a Madam Web solo movie. Now, Madame Web is a Spider-Man character. She is someone who is blind and she's sort of like got clairvoyance powers and this and the other. And is, is Who's clairvoyance? Oh, she's another character. Right, I'll, right, we'll come right. on to her in a bit.